When a dead woman was found on train tracks in Finley, Ohio at 2 a.m. in the morning on March 27th, the whole city was disrupted. Little did the town know the horrors that this woman faced hours before her death. Throughout this video, we will be introduced to a family that has been compared to the Manson family and the matriarch has been compared to Charles Manson. Warning, there are talks of sexual abuse, murder, molestation, rape, and domestic violence. My name is Tessa. Uh, this is a new video for me. I have never made a video like this. As someone who has interest in becoming a journalist and aspiring to be a 48 hours correspondent on CBS News 48 Hours. <laughs> I felt like this was a video that I would really enjoy doing. Now, I saw this documentary on Amazon Prime about a year ago, and I work in a field where we deal with child abuse and neglect a lot, and something about this case just really set very weirdly to me and I felt like I needed to talk about it considering that there's not a lot of people that have talked about it. It also hits close to home for me as I am from and currently living in Ohio and about two hours away from this where this case happened. Another reason why I wanted to do this video today and this week is because it's actually the victim's death anniversary. That's kind of hard and heavy, but it has been 10 years since the murder of Vera Jo Regal. A lot of my information that's presented in this video was provided by the documentary that is currently on Amazon Prime Video titled Goodnight Sugar Babe, The Murder of Vera Jo Regal. Currently, it is $1.99 to rent. It used to be free. I have no idea why it's not free anymore. I don't necessarily encourage you to watch this documentary just because I think that the intention of creating this documentary may have been in the wrong place. It's more focused on the shock value of the family um, and the characters that they are and wasn't so much focused on the victim of the murder, but it's still an interesting watch nonetheless. I will list a few of my other sources as, again, as I said, I think that the documentary didn't do a very good job of documenting the information about this case and the afterwards, which I know that it was probably filmed like soon after the crime had happened. But since then, since 2011, a lot of things have happened and I kind of did my own research about where the family is now. So I think it's important to get started with the victim Vera Jo Regal or Vera Jo Messersmith. We will get into that later on. I think it's important to start about her upbringing. Vera Jo Regal was born and raised in Finley, Ohio, a little city within Hancock County that is 40 miles from Toledo. She was the child of Willard Regal Jr. and Verna Messersmith. Whew, I don't know what it was about all those R's, but that was very difficult. She was born on July 11th, 1986. So she's a little cancer baby like me. Unfortunately, Vera faced trauma at a very young age. At the age of 11, her father had molested her. He is currently serving a 20-year sentence in Lima's Correctional Facility in Ohio. Vera was diagnosed at an unreported age that she had ADHD and that she had the mental capacity and character of an 8 to 12 year old. Despite the adversities that she faced, she went on to graduate from high school and to receive her diploma in 2005. Vera was always known for being willing to help anywhere that it was needed. She was known to be very compliant, almost too compliant, and unfortunately sometimes would be met with the fact that she wasn't able to stand up for herself. She loved country music and would often sing along to the songs that she loved. Once her mother, Verna, and her stepfather moved away, Vera saw this opportunity to move in with her boyfriend, Zachary Brooks, who at the time was 13 years old. I'm sure that we can all see the major problem with this. It is unknown as to how they met considering the drastic age difference, but it is worth noting that Zachary's mother actually strongly encouraged this relationship. They reportedly went on to have an on and off relationship over the course of five years. This is where we will get into the main characters. We have Zachary Brooks, Sherry Brooks, Garth Brooks, <laughs> Chucky Brooks, Michael Brooks, Shannon Brooks, who is Michael Brooks's wife, Danny Bixler, who is Zachary's cousin, and Nicole Peters, who is Danny's girlfriend. In the two years that Vera lived with the Brooks family, CPS and law enforcement were called 
at least 10 times. A variation of these complaints were among harassment, domestic abuse, threats. We are going to move on to the Brooks family and information surrounding them that aren't necessarily pertaining to the case. The Brooks family were often seen in photographs holding up the Crips signs as a few of Sherry's sons, including Zachary, were actually a part of the great a part of the gang. Kevin, or his nickname was Punky Brooks Jr., who was Zachary's brother, was described as the head of the household, and whatever Punky said goes, and even his mother, Sherry Brooks, and his father, Kevin Brooks Sr., were quite afraid of him. Punky was also known as the town's leader of the Crips. That was until his death from a traffic accident on August 5th of 2010. Him and his girlfriend, Heather, were actually on their way to score some heroin when a vehicle swerved off the road and ended up hitting Punky, and this was the reason of his death. It was determined by investigators that this was actually an accidental death, but Sherry Brooks, who we will learn is quite delusional, um, she refused to believe that this was the reason why Punky died and started pushing the blame onto Heather, Punky's girlfriend. She was hungry for vengeance. Following Punky's death, Zachary Brooks, um, Vera Jo Regal's boyfriend at the time, he actually presumed the leadership role in the Crips gang. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. It was in March of 2009 that Sherry Brooks convinced Vera to get pregnant with Zachary Brooks, who at the time was 15, I think is what the calculation would be. Sherry wanted and encouraged all of her boys to have children by the age of 16 or 17. A baby girl was welcomed by the family November 4th of 2010, and this is an appropriate time to tell you about Sherry's obsession with her children having babies at a very young age. Sherry Brooks grew up regularly. Sherry Brooks grew up regularly. Wow, that's a very difficult word for me to say. Sherry Brooks grew up regularly molested by her father, who her father, in fact, was the one that gave her the sugar babe name, which is another one of my gripes about this documentary, is that it was named after. Following this event, Sherry was put into foster care. Little is known about Sherry's time in foster care, but Sherry returned home at the age of 16 and told her mother that she actually ended up having a child while in foster care. Whenever her mother went to go pick up this child, it was later discovered that it wasn't Sherry's child, it was actually another child who had a child within foster care. Sherry eventually ended up having her first child who was named Scotty, and Scotty, even in the documentary, has reported that he was regularly molested by his mother before he was taken away. Sherry continued to have children, and it was almost like she would give birth and they were immediately taken away, or they were taken away within a year of birth. Their names were Joshua, Maria, Michael, and little Sherry. Maria ended up being the most traumatic for Sherry whenever she was taken away. Her mom, Sherry's mom, was even seen in the documentary saying that we were really proud of Sherry for taking care of Maria for a whole year. Maria ended up having to go to the hospital around the age of one, soon before the age of one, um, for her relatives were actually changing her diaper and saw obvious signs of molestation. Once she was treated that day, Sherry was ordered to actually return to the doctors the following day. Sherry did not follow up on this, resulting in Maria being taken away from her. And this is where Vera Jo Regal comes back into play. Her baby that was born was named Willa Dean Brooks. It's pretty clear that Sherry's trauma resulted in Vera Jo Regal becoming pregnant and her encouraging Vera to become pregnant. Unfortunately, this is where Sherry's obsession caused the domino effect for Vera Jo Regal's abuse that she experienced from multiple members of the Brooks family. Vera went from a girlfriend to one of Sherry's sons to a vessel that carried something she so desperately wanted, which was a baby, and specifically a baby girl. She even claimed the fetus as her own before Willa Dean was born. Sherry would go around pointing to Vera's stomach while she was pregnant, saying, my baby. Sherry wanted her son to sign over his parental rights over to her had the baby turned out to be a girl. Sherry ended up inducing Vera's labor um, with a home remedy 
a wife's tail, is that what they're called? <laughs> Which was three bottles of castor oil. Now, this isn't uncommon. The three bottles is uncommon, but castor oil is not an uncommon um, thing to use to induce labor. But usually you just have like two tablespoons, I think is like the recommended amount. So three bottles was incredibly extreme. Sherry went all this length to have the baby born on her birthday, which was November 3rd. Bula Dean ended up actually being born on November 4th, so all of this effort that Sherry went through to have her have the same birthday ended up not even working because Bula Dean was born a day late. And obviously because of her induced labor by a month, Bula Dean was born with heart complications. According to Vera Jo's sister, Ashley Messersmith, and her childhood minister, Vera was very naturally capable of being a mother with her motherly instincts. Unfortunately, due to Sherry's obsession, Vera Jo was not able to fulfill that want to become a mother, and she couldn't fulfill her role as Willa Dean's mother. But according to Sherry, of course, in the documentary, because that's who it's focused on, Sherry says that Vera actually wanted nothing to do with baby Willa Dean. According to Shannon Brooks, who was Sherry's son, Michael's wife, not fiance. According to Shannon, Willa Dean was not able to call Vera mommy. The baby even slept in Sherry's room. Vera was known for wanting to be the best mother she could be to Willa Dean, given her circumstances and hovering of Sherry. If Vera were to touch Willa Dean, Zachary or Sherry would take it into their own hands to abuse Vera for violating Sherry's wishes, basically. There's even a picture of Vera rubbing Sherry's feet, which I will place here, which was her job. That's how it was described in the documentary was that it was her job to rub Sherry's feet because Sherry had terrible feet. If she did anything wrong, Sherry would hit her with a back scratcher. Sherry threatened Vera that if she ever left, if Vera ever left, that she would slash the baby's throat from ear to ear. Feeling cornered, Vera ended up staying and enduring the abuse from the Brooks family. While learning about this case, you kind of forget that Kevin Brooks Sr. was even a part of this, who ended up being Sherry's boyfriend, husband, um, Zachary's father, actually. He kind of was a fly on the wall during this case because I believe he was, like, he had just gone out of prison and, like, he didn't want to be involved in anything because he knew the fate. He didn't want to be involved in anything that would put him back into jail or prison. I mean, anybody in the household could have stopped everything that was happening to Vera, but no one did. So now we will move on to the more graphic, all of it's been graphic though, so it's kind of difficult to say that, but we will move on to the things that Vera encountered whenever it comes to her abuse. In the beginning, Vera would actually fight back with Zachary. She would go as far as throwing punches, cussing at him. It's thought that Sherry's idea of murdering Vera came whenever one day they were doing yard work and Vera was trying to pass a brick, I believe. And while she was trying to move that brick, it ended up falling onto Sherry's feet. Sherry began yelling, you fucking bitch, you fucking hit me with a rock, you fucking bitch. According to Sherry in the documentary, Vera never apologized for this incident. And this is stated in a very vulgar rant. Sherry planned to kill Vera months before her actual murder. Sherry would tell family members on how she planned to kill Vera. She wanted to drug Vera and have her placed on the railroad tracks so that the train, whenever it would go over the railroad tracks, would turn her into hamburger. Is Those are Sherry's words. Sherry went as far as to come up with a cover story that she ended up telling everybody in the house that if Vera ended up dead, that this would be our cover, st cover story to cover our family. So Vera's last months. Leading up to her death, Vera would never come out of her room unless Sherry had called her, and she was known for walking around the house with her head down, avoided eye contact with anybody, very clear signs of depress and obviously trauma with everything that she endured. On January 21st, 2011, a woman called reporting domestic abuse in the Brooks home and that Vera Jo was being held against her will. She was not allowed to go outside or interact with the baby at all. 
They came up with a lie that Vera was dating a guy in Lima, a black guy, was stated, and that he was the one that did this to her nose. This was a lie. Zachary was actually the one who ended up breaking her nose. Shannon actually says that Vera was not allowed to talk unless Sherry approved what she was going to say. Sherry, on the other hand, says, end quote, Vera was scared to talk, so she wanted me to. She didn't talk to nobody. During the visit on January 21st, 2011, Officer Marcia Hill reported that the house smelled terrible and that this was because there was a pig living in a closet defecating everywhere. An ambulance took Vera to the hospital and there was a report made to Child Services, Children's Services. She did not or could not report any details regarding to what happened to her. Vera went on to tell Officer Hill that she liked being with the Brooks family. Officer Hill did her job and asked Vera if she felt the environment was safe for both her and the baby Willa Dean. This was when Vera said, end quote, it was all that she needed. Now we are going to get into the details of why Danny Bixler and his girlfriend Nicole Peters are involved in this case. Danny Bixler had been released from prison three weeks prior to Vera Jo Regal's death. He served in prison for three years for burglary and theft. Now, Danny Bixler was seemingly a distant cousin from Tiffin, Ohio. Sherry in the documentary describes Daniel Bixler, Danny's father, as, me and Danny go way back. We were called the kissing cousins. Danny's father is currently incarcerated for the fact that he stabbed his wife's lover. During his arrest, Daniel Bixler actually led police from three different counties on a chase in an 18-ton semi-truck. Danny and Nicole actually fled to Finley, Ohio to stay with the Brooks once. While in Tiffin, three weeks after he was let out, Danny and Nicole were at a park I think a guy was on the swing. He wouldn't give up the swing to Nicole, so then Danny ended up getting in a fight with him. And before law enforcement showed up, Danny and Nicole fled because he had just gone out of prison. And I think Nicole actually had a warrant out for her arrest. I also want to mention here that Nicole was only 17 at the time. So technically she was a minor. Um, Danny was not. Danny was, I think, 21 years old. Once Danny and Nicole arrived to Finley, Ohio to stay with the Brooks, Vera's abuse got so much, so intensely worse. Zach and Sherry actually told Danny and Nicole that Vera was the one who murdered Punky and that she was the one that pushed Punky in front of the car. Although Vera was never involved in that incident, she wasn't even there. This obviously sparked immense rage from Danny. They started abusing Vera on their own. Their favorite weapon um, was a lock attached to the end of a belt and a big long paddle with the number three on it. The more Vera screamed to Danny and Nicole's abuse, Nicole would actually get sexually aroused and she would start kissing all over Danny. And Danny was getting fun out of this because he understood that Vera was the one that murdered Punky and Nicole was getting off sexually. So it was a leisure activity for the both and that's the nicest way to put about it, I guess. After abusing Vera, Joe, Nicole, and Danny would go off and have sex. All of Vera's beatings from them took place in Sherry's room. I think it's also to say that who knows how much of the abuse the baby had witnessed during her time with the family and during the time that Vera was alive, her own mother. This is where we are going to go into the details of the murder and we will start with the day, the morning of Vera Jo Regal's murder on March 26th, 2011. Police were dispatched to break up a fight that was happening on the road that the Brooks family home was on. They knocked on the door of the Brooks family home and Sherry ended up answering the door. Before she answered the door, Vera was ordered to go upstairs and hide. Even though the police were not there for Vera, she was abused to the point that if they had seen her in the condition she was in, that they would have taken her away. That day alone, before she was murdered, hours before she was murdered, Vera was stabbed in the leg by Danny and Sherry actually stuck her finger within the wound. Vera was forced to eat dog feces by Chucky, sexually assaulted with a toilet plunger, and 
Also at this time, she was on her period and she was also sexually assaulted with a toothbrush and was forced to use it afterwards. Zachary Brooks, Garth Brooks, I can't say that without laughing. It's just asinine. Zachary Brooks, Garth Brooks, Chucky Brooks, Danny Bixler, and Nicole Peters were all involved in this fight that was reported. So once dispatch showed up, Nicole and Danny actually fled from the scene due to their prior warrants out for their arrest. Zachary Brooks also took this opportunity to flee along with them and they went to a house that was like a few houses away. They didn't go super far. So now we will go on to the night of the murder. Zachary, Danny, and Nicole all were yelling at Vera to put her shoes on and that they were going for a walk. It's said by Shannon Brooks, Michael Brooks' wife, that Vera knew that these were going to be her last moments in the house. She knew what was going to happen. She begged Scotty, who she was the closest to in the Brooks home, to come with her. As Scotty went upstairs to go get his shoes to come along with Vera, Zachary actually ended up stopping him, told him what was going to happen, and that he had to stay out of it. During this conversation between Zachary and Scotty, Sherry actually got involved and told Zachary that he was no longer going to be involved in it because... Sherry's family and her image of family and she probably knew that had he been involved in the murder that there was no chance most likely that she was even going to end up with the child. Danny wore a blue bandana to signify that this is official Crips business and he also wore Punky's blue gym shorts. As Vera walked away from the Brooks home for the last time she ended up telling Sherry goodnight sugar babe, which as I said earlier, this was Sherry's nickname given by her father who had molested Sherry when she was very young. And this is where the title of the documentary comes from is that I guess you could see this as being Vera's last words. Security camera from across the street of the Brooks home actually captured the footage of Danny and Nicole and Vera walking towards the train tracks and the direction of the train tracks and they were holding a knife to her. The significance of these train tracks is that one of Sherry's nephews, his name was Travis, ended up dying on train tracks, I think. I don't know the details of that. I don't know if he was ran over or if they were even the same train tracks. I'm not positive. They arrived at the train tracks and this was where they began repeatedly stabbing Vera which ended up being a failed attempt as Vera was still alive after their multiple stabbings. So they ended up going as far as to strip her of all of her clothing and continue not stabbing her. This was where Danny finally decided that this was going to be the final blow and took the knife and sliced her neck from ear to ear. Later on during interrogation and court, Nicole had said that it wasn't working at first. Danny had said that the knife was dull as hell. They were heavily under the influence of alcohol, weed, ecstasy, it, it, extreme use of ecstasy, and cocaine. Vera in total was found to sustain 21 stab wounds, and it was reported that almost every bone in her face was broken. After they were done, they left her body cold and naked laying on the train tracks. The way they positioned her body was that the rails of the train tracks were going this way and they laid her body going perpendicular along the tracks so that whenever the track or whenever the train ran over the tracks, the rails, her body would turn into, as Sherry liked to say, hamburger meat. Once they positioned her, they were ready to leave the scene. They ran off, they actually called a few friends, celebrated, and explained the violent act that they had just committed. Absolutely sick. They ended up attending a party at Desta Bixler's, who is Danny's sister. They ended up going to a party immediately after what had happened. While there, Danny and Nicole were celebrating. Desta actually noticed that Zachary seemed very sad. Um, and he was kind of sulking in a corner by himself at a table. When Desta asked what his problem was, he ended up telling her that Vera had died, that she had been murdered. He also confessed that Danny and Nicole were the ones that murdered her. Desta then questioned Danny, her brother, and he had confessed what he had done. At the party, Shannon Brooks actually talked to Nicole, and Nicole was quoted saying, 
she got her first teardrop tattoo. After Danny and Nicole had left her body laying on the train tracks the way that they did, Vera ended up managing with every last bit of energy that she had to pull herself off of the rails of the train tracks and she was laying in the center of the train tracks. Whether she did this intentionally or not, this is truly what saved the state of her body. Early morning at 2 a.m. on March 27th, 2011, a train operator was going on the tracks and he noticed something laying in the center of the tracks. By the time he was able to stop the train, he was not able to stop it before what he saw, but he was able to stop it and eight tracks had gone over her body. As he investigated, he ended up finding out that it was not, in fact, a baby deer. It was Vera Jo Regal's body. And miraculously, Vera Jo's body, with the way that she was laying in the fetal position, measured out to be 12 inches wide, and the clearance of the train was 13 inches. She, the train ended up clearing her body by one inch. The train operator had called as soon as he found the body that there, he reported a woman's body being found on the train tracks and thus beginning an investigation. The morning of after Desta gathered all of this information that she had received from Danny, Nicole, and Zachary, she went to the police with all of this information. Danny Bixler and Nicole Peters were promptly arrested for aggravated murder. If you've forgotten about Vera Jo's biological mother, don't worry. So did I. I wasn't involved much over, I guess, her tarnished relationship with Vera, but Ashley, Vera's sister, actually, she was one of the people that had called CPS and had called law enforcement to go investigate the house. Um, within the last few months of Vera's life, she was actually isolated from her sister as well, and they didn't maintain contact for the last few months. Vera's biological mother, though, Verna Messersmith is her name, she actually was not contacted immediately after they found and identified Vera's body. This is because Sherry was the one that identified her body and she told investigators that Vera's biological parents had died and that they were no longer living. And the reason Sherry was the one that was able to identify the body is because Sherry was the one that cashed in Vera's social security checks. Also during this morning, instead of doing anything related to Vera's death, um, she ended up requesting custody be to be granted to Zachary for Willa Dean. This was denied and Willa Dean was actually put up for foster care, foster to adopt kind of situation. There's a lot whenever it comes to accusing and motives and cover stories. Like, it's honestly so much. I am trying to organize this video in the most organized way that I could possibly come up with. I really hope that I do a good job because the documentary did an absolutely terrible job with this. So we can start with one of the cover stories that ends up being proven that it wasn't substantial and that it never happened. Due to the extreme injuries that Vera had encountered on the day of her murder, Scotty, her son, actually had to massage Sherry's feet in place of Vera. This was when Sherry told Scotty a cover story and that Vera was going to be murdered. And her intentions of telling him about this cover story were, was to save her family. Sherry's cover story was that Shannon, Michael Brooks' girlfriend, told her that they... I say they with quotes because I'm not too sure if she means Shannon and Michael or if she's still referring to Danny and Nicole. I don't know. It's confusing. Took Vera down to the train tracks and gutted her like a fish. A quote by Sherry was that she deserves it, meaning she deserves to die. Sherry says that Shannon probably wanted to take the baby from Vera so that Shannon and Michael Brooks could have a baby of their own. Support this narrative, Nicole in interrogation during the case and the investigation actually said that Vera had caused an accident in the home where she sprayed pepper spray all throughout the home and this caused Shannon to have a miscarriage. And it says that Sherry made this whole story up and that Shannon was never pregnant. According to a Facebook post made by Shannon prior to uh, prior to Vera's murder and it somehow lines up with Vera's murder and with this 
story. Shannon actually did make a post that she was pregnant. She announced that she was pregnant at the time. Throughout the investigation, though, it became clear that this was a lie. Ultimately, it was decided that this was a way for Sherry, a lie for Sherry to save her family. Also supported by the fact that Sherry refused to let Zachary go on the walk that Danny and Nicole took Vera on to kill her. One of Sherry's multiple lies was that a homeless man named Larry Spencer who lived in the area was framed for the murder. Due to the lack of any kind of sense, this was dismissed pretty quickly. On March 28th, 2011, Sherry and Shannon were both interviewed and this was where they started pushing the blame solely onto Danny and Nicole. Now we will move on to sentencing and charges because I'm sure you're incredibly interested to hear how this all banned out. Shannon Brooks, Michael Brooks, Chucky Brooks, and Sherry Brooks were all charged and sentenced with 30 days of jail time and five years of probation for obstruction of justice. And that was it for them. <laughs> Sherry Brooks's 30 days in jail had to be cut short due to her foot problems. August 17th, 2011, Zachary Brooks, the father of Willa Dean and boyfriend to Vera Jo Regal, was sentenced to four years in prison for previous theft charges and obstruction of justice. So no murder on his end either. In fact, only Nicole Peters and Danny Bixler were the only people charged and sentenced for Vera Jo's murder. Bixler was sentenced to life in prison and was eligible for parole after 40 years of serving. Nicole Peters was actually a minor at the time, as I said earlier, and she was 17 during the time of the murder. She was still tried as an adult and was sentenced to 23 years in prison for her involvement with Vera Jo's murder. I also think it's incredibly important to note that no one was charged or sentenced for Vera Jo's abuse and neglect. I mean, yes, she was an adult, so it's kind of difficult to say anything along the lines of abuse and neglect and torture for an adult. But with all the visits that CPS had made to the household and even the reports that they had said, the house was in deplorable conditions. There is no reason why the baby, Willa Dean, was not able to be taken away from this house. Along with the majority of Sherry's children were actually under the age of 18, so they also could have been taken away. I'm not saying that CPS was neglectful necessarily, because I don't know the conditions that the house was in. Just judging by some of the pictures that I had seen and some of the reports that I had read, I personally don't see that being a safe environment for children to be raised in. During the trial for custody of Willa Dean, um, for Zachary, Zach actually confessed to Dr. Connell that he was present in the home during the day of Vera's murder and the abuse that she endured during the day before her murder. From 3 p.m. to 9.30 p.m., Vera was heard from him screaming and being, be being beaten. At this time, Zachary says that he was in the home with Willa Dean and he says that he tried to intervene and get involved, but that was whenever he was threatened, not the name of who he was threatened by was never enclosed, disclosed, but a knife was put to his throat, so he removed himself from getting involved. Later on in the case, to prove his fitness as a parent, Zachary was ordered to attend two different visits with Willa Dean, and they were supervised. The first visit was cut off after 15 minutes whenever Willa Dean would not stop crying and she refused to even interact with Zachary and she just clung to the monitor of the visit the entire time. After this, he failed to appear for his second visit. Zachary ended up saying during court that he was just, he, he didn't understand the time. Caseworker Carmen Luth, I think is how you would pronounce it, testified that relative placement, so placement with a relative, family relative, was not an option as a sex offender, was living in the household of the maternal, so the mother's um, side. It maybe is Vera's stepfather or maybe her father. I'm not positive about that. And then paternal grandmother, who would be Zachary's mother, which is Sherry Brooks, um, she had four children taken away from her custody 
The case plan that Zachary Brooks was ordered to complete to gain custody or to be considered to gain custody of Willa Dean had a few different orders. Complete a mental health assessment and a substance abuse assessment to find and support a stable home for the child to enroll and attend a domestic violence program. Zachary only completed one of these orders, which was the mental health assessment. Dr. Connell was the one that performed this assessment. It was a personality and intelligence test. Zachary scored a 58 for his IQ, which placed him within the mild mental retardation range, according to the doctor. With this, Dr. Connell says that it would be difficult for Zachary to parent without having a lot of help. The caseworker, Luth, once again, testified that Zachary was not fit to be custodial guardian of, guardian of Willa Dean and did not possess the skills to be a parent. She also stated, which I think is really great to hear, that Willa Dean was getting along very well with her foster to adopt parents. Although she originally struggled with being around males, after Dr. Connell testified that the case was rested, the guardian ad litem assigned to this case, Jane Davis, actually stated that it was within the child's best interest to remain in the foster parent's home. I just wanted to bring up that little fact because I wanted to introduce you to this program called Casa for Kids. Have you ever wanted to advocate for a child's best interest in court, even though you don't really necessarily have the n knowledge, meaning you didn't go to school for law? Um, but you still want to speak up for kids in court. There is a program called CASA for Kids where you can apply to be a volunteer to these cases. So you would actually be an advocate for children and you would speak for the best interest in court. I actually am a CASA. So now you're probably wondering where the Brooks family is now. <laughs> At the time of the documentary, and when the documentary was released, one of the last scenes in the documentary is an interview with Sherry where she points to the wall and she has a picture of the baby, Willa Dean, and a separate picture kind of pasted into this picture of Zachary. And she ends up saying that she hopes that Zachary can return home to where they can get a picture together. And she really has hope that Willa Dean will be returned to her. Later on in 2014, Sherry Brooks actually spent 10 days in jail for inappropriate contact with an unrelated minor. What that means, what exactly happened, I have no idea. I was not able to find, I wasn't able to find information about that. Following this event in 2015, Sherry was also found drug trafficking and she was sentenced to 40 months in prison. And this was because she was on probation for the obstruction of justice charge that she had received for Virjo's murder. I wanted to insert this video because it's honestly insane, her reaction and the fact that she just doesn't understand what the judge is telling her during her hearing. This court had ordered previously that a 30 month prison sentence be reserved. I would find it's appropriate that that full 30 month prison sentence be imposed at this time and I ordered that she served a 30 month prison sentence that I had reserved in her case by virtue of a sentencing entry filed uh, back on November 14, 2011 from a sentencing hearing which occurred on October 26, 2011. And as I imposed sentence in the 2011 case, she be taken into custody to serve that sentence. I believe I issues necessary for some of the law. Anything else you'd like me to cover? Sherry was actually released on February of 2019. Her son Scotty and her husband Kevin Brooks Sr. were also charged with these drug trafficking charges. I don't know what their sentences were specifically. Scotty was also involved in inciting panic whenever he threatened a government building for a bomb threat. Good morning. It is morning now. It's 7.30 in the morning. My phone is going off to head into work, but I wanted to finish this video really quick. My battery ended up dying at four in the morning and 
needed to charge that. So now we're going to continue with the video. We were talking about Scotty Brooks before it turned into daytime for making a bomb threat at a government building and somehow he only got a misdemeanor for this act. And then as far as Zachary Brooks goes, he was released from prison in 2015 for the four-year sentence that he had served for obstruction of justice and petty theft. Um, but he very quickly got himself back into some trouble and had, I don't know exactly what he had, um, served or if he was sentenced with anything, but it looks like there were some assault, um, charges and he was booked. At the trial for Danny Bixler and Nicole Peters versus the state, the prosecutor towards the end actually read a note that they had found in Vera's purse on the scene. Vera's note said, I'm going to write off my computer because it's kind of lengthy. Love you. You are a good little baby girl to us. I'm glad to be your mommy and I am glad I had you on November 4th at 4.16 a.m. 6 pounds, 2 ounces, 19 inches. Mommy loves you. Vera Jo Regal did not have a headstone up until 2013, which would be two years after her burial. I will place a video of the man who was responsible for this happening. Yeah, like most everybody else in the community, I watched this. I watched the video that uh, J. David Miles put out. Uh, after watching that, I was disgusted, and I kind of my heart kind of hurt a little bit. Uh, I felt somebody needed to do something for this girl. Tombstone is messed up before is because everybody wanted it their way, and I was and I told them it wasn't going to be their way. I'm the mom. It was going to be my way or no way. So finally, when everybody decided that, yeah, I'm the mom, and they were going to let me do it my way, she got her tombstone. And that was the argument over Messer Smith, Regal. Yes. And can you tell me a little bit why Messer Smith was so important? Because, because um, my dad adopted me and my sister when we was in high school. I was in ninth, yeah, and yeah, Vera was in yeah. tenth grade, and everybody and everybody don't like that me and Vera was carrying the last name Messer Smith. They want it to be Regal, but my dad is the one. That adopted me and my sister when we was in high school and um, she said if anything ever happened she was gonna stick to the name Messer Smith. Voices for Vera is a group advocating for the reconsideration of the sentencing for a lot of those Brooks family members. I want the opportunity for prosecutors to reopen the case. I feel a lot of the people that were involved were not held accountable to the standards that they should have been especially Zachary Brooks and Sherry Brooks. They were much more involved in the murder of Vera Jo than what is perceived and what they were sentenced with. As a way to represent Vera Jo, they place purple ribbons all throughout the city of Finley, and they have attended a few different like protests. I was not able to find a Facebook group for this group, um, and I haven't heard anything about them since 2013. Um, I'm not sure if they're even doing anything about protesting recently. I hope you all enjoyed this little story time from me. Um, very heavy, very hard, um, and devastating. Yeah, I don't know. I just find it highly concerning that I didn't know much about it. I didn't know anything about it up until this documentary a year ago. I don't want to go to work. <sighs> As I said, this is the 10 year anniversary since Vera Jo Regal had been murdered. I made this video in remembrance of her. No harm was intended by making this video. It was simply just educational and putting a message out there with, I don't have much of a following, but um, this was for educational purposes only and informational purposes only. No harm is meant or intended towards the family. 
But yeah, this won't be the last video that I make of this nature. Um, I'm still going to be making K-pop videos. I'm still going through ideas of what I want this channel to be. I have a few ideas. Um, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video. I thank you for enduring this night with me. And have a good day or a good night wherever you are. Sweet dreams or good morning. Bye.